it's a quick agenda setting. Uh, we'll probably be presenting for about 45 minutes and then we'll get some feedback from all of you. As, so you know, we've better done the network, community, and socializing. Uh, Tim already talked about us. Uh, we start out with a giveaway. So we're gonna give away uh, this Mule Shop t-shirt. There's a nice Hydroplast water bottle in there um, and an exam voucher. Um, so we're gonna have a little quiz question. I'm just gonna do first hand up. Uh, if you know it before I'm done reading, go for it. What are the five different logging levels that the standard MuleSoft logger component uses? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, info, warn, trace. Good start, yep. Good start. Debug. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Error. Go. All right. <laughs> 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 the sharing already. Um, so just uh, what we're actually going to talk about. Um, so it's much more than just logging today. Um, so we want to talk about the importance of logs, so why even log in the first place. Uh, the logging bad practice and best practices. Uh, logging with Log4j2, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, logging the different target systems also with Log4j2. So we're going to be showing the elk stack here. And then creating a custom connector. So why would we even log in the first place, uh, just to set the foundation? So number one, first and foremost, is that system visibility. We've been on too many clients, uh, projects where that system visibility is just nil. We see, you know, we, we try to go in and debug and we just simply don't have enough information to be able to tell a story of what actually happened on a transaction. So that's first and foremost. Um, the system traceability is also so crucial. So for a particular transaction, we want to be able to trace that from end to end throughout its life cycle. Those both just increase supportability of the system, hopefully in the end, saving your business money, which everyone cares about. And then for you know, us who are actually on you know, tier three support after you've implemented a project, you wanna be able to debug that very quickly and effectively. And so this is where you wouldn't take notes. Uh, this is logging bad practice. Um, so if you have no logging standards, that's a pretty bad practice. You don't want developer A, B, and C all logging in different formats, and then you mash all those together, and they're just simply not readable. Again, you want to be able to tell that story in a really nice, human-readable way. Would you say you uh, typically proactively come up with logging strategies? People do, or they typically figure this out after the after the fact, for sure. Uh, all, all, every project, I'll say, that I've ever been on, it's always been after the fact. Every project that we've ever been on, we've come in and enhanced visibility and traceability. It's, it's almost never there. So start with that. <laughs> um, hard coding, so hard coding is okay sometimes. I think uh, hard coding like an informative message is okay at certain points within your code. Um, but let's say if you're, you're hard coding a flow name, for example, and then you go and change that flow name, but it's in 100 different loggers, you have to go to 100 different locations to actually be able to change that. So try to stay away from hard coding as much as possible. We use those variables, use the mel expressions. Uh, empty loggers, empty loggers are okay with you know, in debug, uh, at that debug level, there you go. Um, but try to stay away from them at the info level. Yep. What's an empty logger? An empty logger, we'll see that in a second. So an empty logger, it's a good question. Um, it's going to log the entire mule message. Um, so what I was actually just about to say is when you get a huge payload, let's say you're getting a five megabyte request to a RESTful API, it's gonna log that entire five megabytes uh, of data. Um, so it's gonna fill up your logs really, really quick um, if, if that's not in debug mode. You can flip that on um, you know, after the fact, after your application is deployed to be able to get something like you know, a response log um, from, from an HTTP request, but try to stay away from those empty loggers. And uh, that just segues into the final point there. Those Cloud Hub logs, when you deploy to Cloud Hub, are limited in size to 100 megabytes or 30 days, whichever comes first. And even when you're deploying on-prem, you, know, you want to roll those log files. Um, probably even 100 megabytes is, is on the top end there. Um, so roll those, roll those log files even when deployed on-prem. And then just the infographic on the right, once you start to organize, you really start to standardize. Um, we'll talk about uh, what that leads to in a second here. So, Hopefully not too much presenting. Um, if anyone brought their laptops also, by the way, and you know, you clone the repository, feel free to, to follow along or send in Postman requests. I guess I don't see any laptops, so. But we're gonna get into a demo here of the logging bad practice. Did anyone look at the code by any chance? <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna uh, just describe what we're doing here. Um, 
So what these flows are going to do is uh, we, we were just trying to find an, uh, an open API that we didn't have to authenticate. So we didn't actually have to show you know, credentials here in our demo. Um, what we're going to do here is call out to two different Pokemon APIs. Uh, the first one is going to get a height and weight of a Pokemon and abilities URL. And then we're going to make a second request um, to be able to uh, get the, abil the actual ability of a Pokemon. And so what we're doing here is we just have an HTTP listener, so we can send requests um, to this flow, be able to invoke this flow. We're creating a transaction ID, and then we have some loggers here. Um, so what we see here is received inbound requests. Okay, you know, seems pretty innocent here. Um, we have an empty logger here, so this is you know, the answer to your question. We're gonna log the entire mule message here, so everything under the sun. We're going to set that Pokemon name after logging those. We're going to log that we're about to call the Pokemon API. We're going to call that Pokemon API. We're going to get the response, set some variables here, um, including the height and weight and that abilities URL to be able to call the second API. We're going to log one more time, uh, calling Pokemon API to list abilities. We're going to call that Pokemon API. I'm saying Pokemon a lot. <laughs> uh, we're actually going to get that ability. And then we're going to return that response uh, back to the, the caller of, of uh, this flow. Um, and then finally, we have a logger at the end. One last thing to point out there is in the exception handler, we're going to log alert error occurred at that error level. There you go again. Um, and so let me just call this. And we have this deployed in Cloud Hub. This is a bad example. This is the bad example. What not to do. And I'll, I'll show you why all that is. So it looks pretty, pretty innocent right now. Um, but this is what not to do. So. Let's send in a bad request there to start. We're gonna get an error response. Uh, we'll look at that in a second, and let's just send in something for Pikachu. And we see that Pikachu you know, has lightning and, and all that good stuff. Weighs 60, height is 40. <laughs> How much did you learn about Pokemon in this project? A lot. <laughs> I remembered like 10 different Pokemon, like, you know, just, just quiz me. Um, there's a little preview of Elk, but let's get into our, our project here. Uh, so what we see here for that error is we see that the alert error occurred, but the problem with this now is we don't know what this ties to. So we don't know what request that ties to. It could tie to um, this particular error here, but if we had 500 requests all coming in in parallel at the same time, it could be this error, it could be something else. Um, so it just gets more pronounced as you, know, you, you gain traffic um, hitting this API. We also see here, um, you know, Rob, this is an example of, of that empty logger. We're logging everything under the sun. And we're, we're not logging any uh, transaction ID here. So we don't really have any visibility. Um, if I pull out a transaction ID from the actual successful request here, you know, we can deduce by date that this is probably the request that we sent in. You know, it's for Pikachu. It occurred around 54 after the hour. Um, but if we pull out that transaction ID, all we're going to see there is just this empty logger. We don't know what events actually occurred within that system. So if I were to send in 500 parallel requests again, it just gets really confusing really fast. And so you want to be able to tell that story really well using you know, the traceability, the visibility of your log. So let me flip to logging best practices. And if you are taking notes, this is where you would, you would do it. Um, so first and foremost, just standardize. Um, that's so key. It doesn't matter what your standards are, really. You can define a schema you know, that no one can differ from. You can define uh, JSON, um, just key value pairs, other formats. You know, it can even be XML. We've seen that in the past. Um, doesn't really matter as long as everyone's sticking to that and you have a way to enforce that. Um, if we look at the infographic there on the right, Standardization leads to stabilization and optimization. Uh, so just remember that. Define those standards first, and that's going to allow so many possibilities for you to enhance your platform. Informative messages. Um, so tell the story. You know, event A occurred, event B occurred, event C occurred, done. It's so easy for somebody to be able to get in there and, and say, you know, okay, all of these events occurred. Um, easy to debug, easy to support. You want that visibility into the system. That's what you're doing there with those informative error messages. It enhances debugging, and you, you typically want to do that before and after uh, external calls out to, to external systems. You want that request identifier. So this is enhancing the traceability of your flows. Um, you'll be able to trace those from end to end and even have the ability to calculate latency. So API Manager can do that for you if, if um, 
you've registered your API with the API manager. But it's also nice sometimes, right when you're just in the logs, you can calculate latency right there. And we'll look at that in a second. So I'm not actually in presentation mode, but I'll be clicking back and forth a lot here. Um, so best practices continue. Uh, dynamic error messages. Be sure to log those dynamic error messages along with your transaction ID. You want to know when an error occurred, what that actually tied to. Um, persisting logs to an external system um, when you can. I would, I would definitely recommend persisting logs to an external system. You can maintain historical logs. So like I said, if you're deploying Cloud Hub, those will roll. So you either want to persist those Cloud Hub logs or log to an external system that you can control. Um, it also allows non-technical users to support your platform. Um, you know, if you're, we're going to use Elk Stack here, you can start to give people login information to Kibana, for example, to be able to log in there and, and help support your platform. And then just in general, not too much logging, not too little. You know, you know, you don't want to go overboard, fill up those logs too fast, and you want to have the visibility in your systems. One more demo here on best practice. And what we're going to do in this flow is the exact same thing. We're going to go through the same series of requests, just with the best practice. Um, a couple of small changes here, is we're going to set that flow name, uh, the name of the Pokemon, the transaction ID, right up front, so that we can log it. Um, don't worry about set NDC for now. I'll come back to that. But we're going to log the beginning. And what you're going to notice here is that message. We've just put JSON right in here. You can format this with data weave. That's completely fine. And then reference that, that variable from your logger. Um, if you'd rather use data weave or you know, object of JSON, whatever it's going to be. Um, we've just put JSON right in here. And you can notice that the transaction ID is, is now in our JSON, as well as some other variables that are pertinent to this request. We have a debug logger here. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit later too, um, but just know that the category is on the get Pokemon number and it's at the debug level. So we won't actually see this log right now. Uh, we're gonna transform that response, set the height and weight. We're gonna log before calling the, the second API here. Um, you can see that this looks very similar to that first JSON there. Um, we've added a little bit more pertinent information here, like height and weight. We have that you know, crucial transaction ID there. We're going to transform that response, set the ability, um, transform the payload to be able to send back to the customer or the client calling the API. And then we're gonna log that, that last event there again in the same exact way. So it's getting even a little bit repetitive there, but that's, that's good. The only thing we're changing there is that, that message. And then again, don't worry about MDC. And then in our exception handler, the last thing to point out there is, is we're logging the dynamic error message along with the transaction ID. So just to demonstrate that, and send in our bad request here again. Okay, we have our error. And send something in for, uh, I don't know, you. Oh, so much about Pokemon now. <laughs> and so let's go to. Burn, paralyzed, and poison, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so much <laughs> powerful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. Um, so we can see here, let's just pull out a transaction ID. This looks like the one from the successful request since I'm just sending these in one at a time. And let's see the story that it tells. Um, so this particular transaction ID, event A occurred, event B occurred, event C occurred. It's so easy to be able to tell that, you know, right, um, like exactly the, you know, um, events that occurred within the system there. Um, we can see that we received that inbound request, Pokemon information received, and then we're done. And even more relevant is that error there. Um, so let's pull out the transaction ID here, and the story here becomes even more relevant. So for this transaction ID, we see that only that first event occurred, and then we ran into an error. But that error is, is tied directly to that transaction ID, so we can find it so quickly here. Um, we know right when it came in, we can even calculate um, the latency here. You know, this, this happened in only a few milliseconds there, um, if we wanted to. So that transaction ID is, is absolutely crucial to the traceability. Of this sounds system. like a hard lesson learned. Can you it talk is. about how you learned this lesson? Yeah, um, at a client that we came into, for me, about two years ago, it was actually for you about four years ago. You might want to say? What's that? Uh, no, probably not. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, they, they essentially had no visibility and no traceability in their system. Um, they actually still have a couple applications out there on Cloud Hub. There's probably about 15 deployed in Cloud Hub that you try to go debug that thing and everyone everyone shies away you know nobody wants to debug that um jesse's on on the project with me he knows exactly what i'm talking about kenny back there too um it, it's the, it's a supportability nightmare um so we've gone through 
probably thousand hour projects to go in there, excavate, um, enhance their logging, um, give them guaranteed delivery of their logging so we're not losing any logs. Um, again, I mean, just huge, huge projects. So do it the right way um, the first time. All right, uh, that was best practice. Okay, uh, logging with log4j2. Um, what we're doing here is, uh, I'm just going to describe log4j2. Does anyone know what log4j is? Lost part. Cool. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a, a logging framework. Um, it's really, really cool. Um, so there's, there's uh, with any new mule project, by default, there's source main resources, um, log4j2.xml, where your configuration is going to live. Um, look in there with any default mule project, you'll have uh, one appender in there. We'll talk about what that is. Uh, the components of log4j2, you're going to have a configuration, you're going to have appenders. Uh, this log4j2 Cloud Hub log appender is going to log to Cloud Hub when you turn off logs. And we'll talk about why you do that in a second. Uh, and then you have loggers. Um, loggers actually um, um, generate the logs for you. They actually create the logs for you. Appenders um, actually uh, send out a log to a target. And then you see a layout here. If you look at the infographic on, on the right, it's sort of part of an appender, which we'll see in a second. But the layout is, is for formatting a log and, and parsing a log, um, getting into that format that you want. Um, so we'll talk about here really quick. And then point studio. A lot of 4J2 configuration that we set up for this project. Um, and this is all on GitHub, so feel free to go, go clone this. Great issues, you know, let us know how we're doing. Um, the configuration here at the top, we just have three packages that our appenders are using. The appenders, um, again, are all used to log to a target. So this first appender here, the rolling file appender, this is the default one that's going to come with every application that you start, um, every new mule application. And so just a couple things to point out here. Um, this one is logging to a local file at this location here. Um, pretty self-explanatory. The pattern layout is that layout that I was talking about. Um, so you can see some variables in here. You know, these percent sign letters are all variables, which we'll look at in a second here. Uh, the resource name and resource ID. Um, if you remember back to the MDC that I told you to forget about, um, that's what's actually being referenced here. And we'll look at that also in a second. And then we're rolling those logs every 10 megabytes. Um, one of the really cool appenders, this is actually a custom appender that we found on GitHub, um, is the SQS appender. Um, is everyone familiar with Amazon Web Services, Simple Queue Service? General. Oh, awesome. Good question. Yeah. What, what happens when a log is rolled over? Uh, just generates a new uh, a new log. <clears throat> okay. It just moves the, the old one. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so so Amazon Web Services Simple Queue Service. Just really quick for those of you who aren't familiar, it's Amazon Web Services queuing technology. Um, so Big Compass is set up an SQS queue here in our AWS account, and what this appender is doing is it's sending messages out. For each log that we're generating and sending a message out, and that's being consumed by the Elk stack, which um, we'll also get into here in a minute. And then the final one, this one's really important when you deploy to Cloud Hub. To allow your log4j2 configuration to take over, you have to actually disable Cloud Hub logs, um, and I'll show you how to do that. But this one's responsible for continuing to log to Cloud Hub, uh, is, is what this appender is responsible for. So just a couple more things to point out here before we actually uh, get into the meat. Um, those are appenders. Loggers actually generate those logs for you. And you can see that each one of these async loggers um, is responsible for a particular Java package. Um, so you know, this particular HTTP message logger here is at the warn level. And this is when you deploy your application, this is the default level that that particular package is going to, to log at. Um, this is one of the advantages actually over like system.out.println in Java. Um, you can define different packages at different levels to be able to you know, f have fine grain control over your logging. Um, one to point out is org.mule is at the info level. Our git Pokemon number here is also at the info level, and that's why when we were at the debug level of that git Pokemon number um, on that second flow, which I'll look at again in a second, uh, we didn't log out. Um, 
that, at that debug level. And so all of these are asynchronous. All three of those appenders will all log out in parallel um, as fast as they can. It's all asynchronous. You can control your threads with Log4j if you want to. So you can have 10 threads. Um, if you have 10 appenders and you want them all uh, you know, going out in parallel at the same time, or you control that. So you definitely just have to look at your, your resources there um, and make a balanced decision on you know, efficiency versus the, the resources that you're using. And then finally, at the root level, we're just registering each one of those appenders. A little more content can here. Can you review really quick the difference between a logger and an appender? I find those terms very confusing. Yeah, so the logger, so lo it goes logger, <laughs> appender, layout, if we're looking at it, you know, in, in terms of hierarchy. Um, so logger is the parent. Logger is actually responsible for generating the log. Okay. The appender is responsible for sending it out to the target system. The, um, the layout is responsible for formatting. And this is running outside the new <coughs> new VCP views, right? Uh, the oh, part. the Elksa? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I think, I mean, the point I was trying to make is that a lot of time when we lock too much, we are running on a vCore or vCPU, mm -hmm. we're paying a lot of money to new, but moving it out, you know, and logging it outside in AWS, you could have still achieved that, but, you know, like, your cost is, you are optimizing your CPU for the actual processing, the logging through, right, a standard framework. It's 100% relevant, yeah. If you have point one B cores, you could use up, if you have a lot of appenders here, you can use up a lot of resources. Um, so what is Elk Stack? Uh, I think this is the coolest part of the presentation. Um, Elk Stack, really quick, is Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. Um, in order there, if we start at the top here on the right, Logstash is used to ingest logs. Um, it parses and filters them, and it persists them to Elasticsearch, which is really a NoSQL database. Um, and then once you have all those logs persisted in Elasticsearch, Kibana is used to actually visualize that information. Um, so it provides really good dashboarding tools and visualization tools to be able to gain value out of the data that you have in Elasticsearch. And the way that we've set this up is we've installed that on an Amazon EC2 instance. Uh, it's recommended to, to decouple those and split those apart because they actually do use a lot of resources. Um, we just put them on, on one instance here because it's, it's just a basic setup. Um, but what we've done is if you see on the left here, MuleSoft is using that log4j2 configuration to send messages out to the SQS queue um, for each log that it's generating. So it's sending, you know, every, every time I do that, it's sending those three events out to the Amazon SQS queue. And then on the other side, Logstash is configured, uh, just one second, <laughs> um, to pick up those messages from the SQS queue, append those, do Elasticsearch, where we can visualize them in, in Kibana. Yeah, go ahead. So how does log4j differ from CloudTrail? Differ from CloudTrail? Uh, so CloudTrail, you're talking about AWS CloudTrail, right? It's free You're talking about an AWS? Yeah, AWS. Well, so if you have an AWS implementation and everything is going through AWS, like let's say you're using Lambda or EC2, for example, and you know you have CloudTrail, um, you know, pulling in all of your logs and you know maybe saving those out to S3 or saving those even to, to Elk, um, that's a great setup too. Um, in terms of you know differences, like Sean Cars is our AWS expert here. If you want to you know talk more about that later? Does that answer your question though? Yeah. I think I think it's more the, the source and and uh, infrastructures. It's just different. Yeah, I think I mean, if you if you deploy an app on CloudHub, you can't use CloudTrail because yeah. CloudTrail right. Well, I don't know if you have an answer. So you have to use a lot of projects. The only way to sort of unplug that or uncork that data from CloudHub is the only mechanism. Cloud trail is not available, right? Yes. So uh, there are a couple of we can talk offline, but um, there are a couple of side differences. One is that not all customers run, you know, like the mule in the cloud, first of all, right? So what do you do in that? This this solution will still work for your on-prem stuff, or uh, if you're running outside, you know, like in some of the VPCs. Right? So. So, and, and what it does is that, you know, it gives you a more granular control. CloudTrail is more generic, right? So the alerts you are getting there are, are a standard cookie cutter out of the box, unless you're writing Lambda function to capture that, right? 
Um, the log4j would be able to do that for all the events that are going to the new um, process. That makes sense. Makes sense. <coughs> cool. Um, so we've decoupled this architecture. Just good architecture so that if our MuleSoft application fails yeah, or the EC2 really fails, we're good to go. Yeah? So, so uh, how does it differ from capturing the logs in Splunk? Is it similar to Splunk? It's very, very similar. Yeah, uh, Logly, very, very similar. So different competitors? Is yep. Splunk yep. Uh, Elk is open source. It's free yeah. to you know, get started. Splunk, Splunk is... is <laughs> Splunk is free. Logly, you know... Is this uh, open source? Or? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yep. Instance? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Or somewhere to host it. And just, just, just the store in it too. Okay. All right. So that's Elk. Any other questions on Elk or how that's set up? Awesome. Sorry. I, so if you are going to use Splunk, you would use Log4j to send it over there. That's one of the ways to get it to Splunk, right? You could. We were going. We were between uh, uh, sending these out to Splunk versus. Elk. Yeah, Splunk's got, like a, Splunk's got like a forwarder. They, Splunk's a whole different beast because it's got all these different different mechanisms for getting the data over there. And Log4j is just one of them to get it out. Anyway. Yeah. Um, and Logstash, this is just one way to get those logs into, into Elasticsearch. Um, you can set up an HTTP listener, for example, if you wanted to have, have synchronous calls out to yeah. Logstash. The difference on the Splunk versus this is that Splunk will only forward you have to write the log on the mule instance and then it will forward the log. Because oh, Splunk is a, a forwarder mechanism, right? It's like reading a file, not a event. <coughs> so reading a file and then forwarding the content. I versus here you're forwarding the event that as, they are, as they are generating, right? But uh, does this have any like uh, dashboard of the Splunk has a lot of dashboard functionality in it? Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's a good segue. We're going to look at that in, in one second here. Uh, so last thing before we get into that demo is uh, logging with Log4j, um, deploying to Cloud Hub like I was alluding to before. If you want to let that Log4j uh, Cloud Hub appender take over, you have to disable logs. Um, and in order to do that, you have to open a ticket um, with MuleSoft. And they'll prove that. It was fairly quick for us in order to do that. Um, and that allows your log4j2 configuration to take over to, to actually log the Cloud Hub. Um, so just really fast. Oh, we have to, we don't have to log in here. Uh, it's just this check mark when you get that approved. Disable your Cloud Hub logs and then restart the application. Um, it's going to take away there your, your logging uh, tab. You see that? And then you get all these warnings here. You know, they want to make, you know, they don't have any liability if you messed up your configuration or anything like that. And you probably noticed here also. We also have this uh, this warning here, um, so just make sure you're solid on, on your log4j configuration before you actually disable those logs, and it's not necessarily recommended. And demo with Elk Stack. Um, so let's switch over to Elk. So let's land on our high-level dashboard. Um, so hopefully this answers a lot of questions for you back there. Uh, first of all, we're looking at the last week of requests here. Um, so I've been sending in a lot of requests. Doesn't sound like anyone else has, but that's okay. Um, we can change this very easily. It's, you know, it's all relative, um, or you can do absolute time there. Um, we have a ton of searching options there. We have a ton of filtering options, which we'll look at in a second. Um, but you know, just from the high level, this would be great for somebody to come in and see what happened in the last week. So we had almost 2,000 requests, um, uh, meaning there was 2,000 individual logs sent out to SQS. Um, just a different way to visualize it here on the second visualization. Uh, you know, if you want to start to alert, um, like we were talking about uh, before this, you want to start to alert when you get to a certain metric um, in the orange or red, you can, you can do that here. Uh, you can count your number of errors versus success. Uh, it looks like Charmander is absolutely maxed out here, so we're counting our top five Pokemon. Wow, we have 300 Charmander requests. I'm surprised Pikachu wasn't uh, you know, the most common one. Yeah, it's the only one I can say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. Um, I tried to mix it up. Uh, we have just some pie graphs here, um, just a different way to visualize what our top Pokemon were. Is this uh, out of the box, or is this all, did you handcraft each one of these gauges? I handcrafted each one, and I'll, I'll show you how to do that. It's pretty easy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, each one of these visualizations was, um, it's out of the box functionality, but uh, you just have to use you know, the, correct, uh, the, the correct key value pairs, basically. 
Um, so Charmander sucked up uh, one third of our requests there. Um, again, just a different way to visualize from top to bottom there what, uh, what Pokemon were requested. And then we get into some metrics over time. And I think this is really cool and it's been really useful for me at, at our client. Um, we can start to see peaks and valleys here. And that has been really useful for us. Um, you can see, for example, over the weekend, you might get a valley. Uh, you don't get a lot of requests. You know, let's say you're in the transportation industry, you know, not a lot's happening on the weekend. Um, and then Monday, 8 a.m., you see spikes all throughout the week, you know, dipping at night. Um, you can even start to hopefully save money if you do that, if you've set up a scalable infrastructure to be able to scale out during the day, uh, during the day scale back down at night um, or on the weekend, um, you can save some, some coin there. Um, so just a nice way to be able to predict um, what's going to happen within your platform. And again, just a different way to visualize that. This is the same graph as above here, um, but you can see that it's broken down by Pokemon. And then last here, you can start to even get into some low level details here um, and more of the, the, you know, like MySQL view, more of that, that grid table view. Um, you know, so you can see for each one of these requests, um, what's the daily average number of requests. You can start to actually create calculations in the background in Kibana. Um, you can even start to filter, you know, on each one of these individual table values here. And I'm just gonna show really quick at the top, you know, here's a couple filters just by clicking there. Um, you can see how those filters are changing. It's very, very easy to add uh, a filter. If I delete that, you know, I add a filter. I can filter on um, a bunch of stuff here. You know, SPS send time, one of those transaction IDs I can pull up here as well. And one of the more powerful things that you can also do if you go to the, visual, or the Discover tab here is you can actually start to see those logs in more of that standard format that you're probably used to seeing on, on like Cloud Hub, for example. So I have this filtered down to a transaction ID here, and I can see those events A, B, and C just as they occurred in Cloud Hub. Um, you know, I can start to filter, see what happened even in the last week. I clear out this filter, fresh. Um, you know, this, these are my levels of requests over the last week. I can see those messages and, and search really for anything. If I drop down one of these, um, I can see all those key value pairs that I'm logging out in JSON format to SQS. Any questions on Elk? That's how, Elk. How did you get that transaction ID out? Is, is that in Log4j you configured that, like a regex? How did you get that transaction out of the middle of that message yeah. to a clean, searchable name value pair? Yeah, good question. Anyone who's, who wants to dive deeper into this, just come talk to me after this. I love this stuff. Um, we logged out in SQS messages just in raw JSON. So it's, those, it's the same format that you saw um, in, in Cloud Hub there. It's right. this exact same format here. And so it's, it's all valid JSON. And what Logstash is then able to do, that's the, the parsing mechanism that persists to Elasticsearch. Um, it's able to parse that as JSON and persist that into Elasticsearch as key value pairs. Gotcha. Uh, and, yeah. Is that configuration difficult in Logstash? Um, I was telling someone earlier, maybe it's Kobe, um, that, that setting up Elk is, is the tough part. You know, so there's three components to it, right? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a decent install. Um, once you get over that hump and you start working with Kibana and everything's good there, um, it's, it's all pretty much out of the box. Um, really, the hard part is the setup and, and getting those logs into Elasticsearch. All right, uh, one more giveaway. Hopefully nobody saw that. Um, I should even go into <laughs> the presentation mode here. All right, let's break it up. We're a good amount of way through the presentation, but uh, one more giveaway. So anyone, first raise your hand. Uh, the standard MuleSoft logger component uses what framework to log? Yeah, who said it? Yeah, that's, that's too far for real. <laughs> yeah. I didn't hear the answer. Log4j. 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 Yep. And so any bonus points on um, what the, the interface it is that, impl that it's, it implements? It's in the name. It's the logger, the logger interface. <laughs> we'll see that in a second. It'll come up here. Uh, so we're going to get into creating a custom connector. So this seems maybe um, way out in left field, but we're going to tie it all in, I promise. Um, so to create a custom connector, um, there are some prerequisites here, you, know, you have to have Java installed, you have to have any point in studio installed. 
Um, but once you do that, install the dev kit plugin in AnyPoint Studio if you don't have it already. And then once you have that ready to go, it's very easy to create a, a custom connector project. Um, it scaffolds out a whole lot for you and you can actually be started in, in seconds. Um, so creating that custom connector is easy as, you know, uh, just like our MuleSoft applications, file new AnyPoint connector project. And I'll take us through that here. So I'm going to select any point connector project. Um, I'm going to do SDK based. Um, I've actually never done a SOAP based connector. Um, just put in our name. I'm going to use a bunch of default values here and just go through that. Um, you know, you can look back through here um, or I'm happy to talk more about this, but I've done a, a Java SDK API type for the, the custom connector that we developed for this presentation. And then what's really nice is if you generate these sample operations and configurable fields and some of these feature stubs down here, you'll be up and running in seconds, really. Um, so I've generated error handling, uh, message source, and generate tests. Um, so just overall error handling for the connector is really nice. Uh, the message source, this is if you want to use it in the source part of your flow, so sort of as the input to your flow. And then generating tests is going to generate some JUnit tests automatically for you. Um, for some people, it generates too much, um, so I actually ended up blowing all of that away uh, for this particular project, not doing any of that, and just starting from scratch, because um, it, it does generate uh, quite a few classes that you have to delete. But just to play around with, it's very nice. Um, it uses Maven. I'm going to use the default settings here, um, but remember the group ID and the version is going to come back later here. You can add GitHub information if you have that set up beforehand. And then the last thing you can do here is, you know, you can see as I type there, uh, the label on the custom connector is, is going to change and you can change that logo. So I'm going to cancel out of that just a little bit more information on the custom connector there. So once you've created it, that package structure is going to look like this uh, infograph on the right, or this picture on the right. Uh, it's Maven uh, to handle all your dependency and, and build. Um, so we're gonna look at that pom.xml file. The implementation lives in source main Java, so it's just pure Java code. Um, you have annotations in there. Um, you know, Spring is being used as well. Um, the implementation itself, you can have source processors or processors. Um, so again, your source is gonna allow you to put that in the source of your flow, and a processor, you know, it'll be in the normal part of your flow. Uh, we've just created a, a processor here um, to mimic the logger. Uh, you're gonna have error handling there, which we're gonna go over. Um, you can generate a custom icon, and then you can have your JUnit tests to be able to test locally without having to use it in a flow, which is really, really nice. So let's look at that package structure really quick. And I'll go over this custom connector. And so what we're doing here is all we're going to do is again log. So I promise you I'd tie this back in, um, but what this custom connector is going to do is going to take a hash map as input. It's going to transform that into JSON. So it's going to actually enforce the JSON structure um, that, we, that we saw earlier. And it's going to log that out. It's going to use log4j2 um, by default since we're importing this guy here. Is that uh, logger interface. We're implementing that logger interface. Um, but just a couple notes here. I left in some stubs if anyone wants to clone this. So this is, would be for error handling. Um, again, for error handling here. Um, we have our connector. So our, our name of our connector is going to show up as custom logger. And then we're going to see um, uh, you know, just some variable initialization here. Um, so we're instantiating our logger. Again, using log4j. We're gonna have a couple enums here. So these are used for inputs to your connector. If you want a drop down list for inputs, like if you think of um, uh, the logger today, when you're able to drop down the level and see those five options there, that's, that's an enum in the background. Um, that's gonna allow you to have that drop down. So we have inputs for log format. Um, we can log in JSON or standard, um, we're calling it standard, which is just gonna log out in key value pairs. And then you can have the five log levels that the standard logger has. I also left in the stub for the configuration. So if you want to create a global configuration, you can do that. Um, think like HTTP listener, global configuration, SQS global configuration, that would be how you do that. I left in the stub, if anyone wants to see it, of a source. Um, it just uses that source annotation, pretty standard, and then uses a method. But what we're actually doing is we're using the processor annotation here. We're going to use the send log method that has these three inputs. So it's going to take that hash map of the log params it's going to take the, the log format. So I'm doing JSON here, and it's going to take the log level. So it can, it can log in any one of those five levels. 
And then what it's going to do is just basically say, okay, is this JSON? I'm gonna format that hash map into JSON. Otherwise, let's just format it in key value pairs and I'm actually going to log. Um, so getting a little bit more in the weeds there, uh, method to be able to format that hash map into JSON log here, method to be able to format that into standard key value pairs, and then method to be able to actually log. So pretty simple stuff. Um, you know, none of this is, is too crazy. Um, this log is going to log at the appropriate log level, which is really cool, and you can provide that as input, which we'll see in a second. You have the connector config and the error handler here. Um, it's all just commented out and, and stubbed out, um, but feel free to clone this and, and take a look at it. And the last thing I'll say about this is it just stubbed out a JUnit test case also. Um, so really nice to be able to run that locally. Just uh, all, I'm, all I'm doing here is validating that I'm actually logging um, as I want to. So I'm formatting in JSON and I'm formatting in those key value pairs. So pretty simple to get started with. The next thing you might want to do is actually install a user connector. Um, so very, very simple to do that. It uses Maven in the background. Um, you can use the Maven command if you want to, which we'll, we'll look at. Um, but all you have to do is once your implementation is done, right click, install or update, and then you can use in a flow. Um, so all you have to do, any point connector, install or update. And I'll let that run, but I'm gonna get a success message here in a second. Are you, are you going to talk about why you use a connector? What's the advantage of this approach? Yeah, um, I wasn't actually. So <laughs> you have to you have to weigh when you, if you're going to create a custom connector. First of all, look out there, see if anything exists. You know, that's that's rule number one. Um, we're really just showing here how to create a connector. Um, I've I've never actually had to do this for a client, so I'll say it's it's going to be probably pretty rare. Um, you can even create you know custom Java in, in your MuleSoft project, right? To, accomplish something pretty similar. But if you want to create a custom connector, the really cool part is the usability part. So publishing out to Exchange, which we'll talk about in a second, um, to be able to let everyone in your organization do something the same way every time. Um, so for example, in this, you'd be able to format your log the same way every single time. Um, that's going to enforce that. Um, yeah. Uh, so we probably got the success message here. Yep, it was installed. Um, so we're going to flip back to PowerPoint. Uh, so the next thing you might want to do is, is package your connector. So if you're using pure Maven, um, uh, just taking one step back, uh, Maven clean install will actually install that into your local Maven repository. So that's what just happened here when I clicked install or update from AnyPoint Studio. And then packaging your connector to create a zip to actually deploy to Exchange um, is Maven clean package. Um, if you install or update from any point studio, you're gonna see in the target folder that you already have that zip. Pretty easy to do. I'd recommend just to do it from any point studio. Um, really no reason to go to the command line there. And then you can get it into Exchange, upload this zip, and you have a custom connector on Exchange uh, for, your, for your organization. And the very last thing, I think this is one of the cooler parts of, of the custom connector, is if you wanna to publish to Exchange, you can do it the manual way by uploading that zip, which I'll show in a second or you can use Maven. Um, Maven, there's a little bit of a setup there, but it's very, very streamlined. So there's three steps. You have to add your organization's ID to the group ID tag in your POM. You have to add your organization's repository um, to the POM as well. And then I can't show this third step because it has username and password in there, but in your Maven settings.xml, um, which I'm happy to discuss more with people because I can't show it. Um, in your Maven settings.xml, configure your, your organization's repository. So looking at our POM for this custom connector, what we're going to see just starting from the top is Big Compass's organization's group ID here. Um, and so all you have to do is just plug that in. You can find this in Access Management in Cloud Hub. The version is what's going to be uploaded to Exchange, and we'll see this in a second. You have to version this up every time you deploy it. You can't deploy the same version to Exchange twice. And then the name. This name will be uploaded to Cloud Hub, as you see it here, as custom login. The second step there is in this distribution management tag. Um, you're going to see here that the repository, I configured this in Maven settings.xml beforehand, so it's called BC repo. This has to match what's in your Maven settings. Um, so this is configured you know, with my username and password to be able to upload to Cloud Hub. 
It's our big compass repository. This URL here is pretty static. The only thing you're going to notice is this part, again, is our organization ID from Cloud Hub. And then once you've done those two steps, plus gotten your Maven settings up and running, what you can do is, on the right, Connector. Once we're in there, we can run. And that, that's super tiny, so verbalize. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. So this is actually going to fail. Does anyone know why? Because <laughs> your settings are XML. Close. In the palm, I actually didn't version up. So this version is already on Cloud Hub. You all probably didn't know that. Um, but build failure. It's already in Cloud Hub. So let's go take a look at that. Does the error say that? There it does. Uh, if you can kind of see here, I don't know if I can blow that up. Oops. Uh, build failure. Is command um, plus work there? there you go. No, you yeah, command. Yeah, command plus doesn't work on terminal. But yeah, it's it's a pretty informative error message. Uh, so in exchange. What we're gonna see is our, our custom logger. So let me click on this really fast. What I've done is I've uploaded four versions of this logger. So what's really cool is it keeps a snapshot of each version. I can come back to this. You know, if I was following best practice, I'd probably have a description in here. Um, you know, maybe even some code blocks of, of how to actually use the custom connector for everybody else using this. Um, you know, I can go to each one of these. Um, I can download it also. That'll download it as, as a zip package to which thing you can install using AnyPoint Studio. And then also the cool thing is that if that's deployed in Exchange, let's go to our, our Pokemon.xml here. Um, you know, I've already installed this in my local Maven repository, so I can see it there. But if I search Exchange here, so anyone from AnyPoint Studio with access to your Exchange now can start to just pull that down right from AnyPoint Studio, be using that right away, you know, basically at the click of a button. So you know, back to your question, um, very easy to, to standardize and do something the right way every time if you have a need for it. All right, and the last piece there is going to be the demo on the custom connector. So this third flow is going to do the exact same thing as the second flow. Third flow, the only difference here is we're going to be setting our log content and that's gonna provide a hash map to the custom connector. Uh, the custom connector configuration is kind of cool. If you remember those inputs there, we have uh, send log as our operation. That was the method that we used as, as our processor here. Uh, the log format is JSON. You know, I can drop this down and choose standard there. Um, our log level is info. In this case, we're going to see in the exception handler, it's going to log out as, as the error level. And then uh, from this data weave, I don't think I pointed this out, we're creating the log content flow variable there. So we're going to pass that log content flow variable into the log grams of that custom connector. Remember that as an input. We're gonna call our Pokemon API, and we're gonna log three times just as we did in the previous flow there. So again, um, setting this in a nice standard way, it's going to log this out as JSON. You know, we're logging the relevant information that we need along with that transaction ID for traceability. All we're doing here is referencing that log content, very easy to use. This stays the same all throughout the flow. All we're doing there is, is changing that message. So we're at our end here, using the same configuration here. And then in the exception handler, all we're doing is setting our error message there, passing that into the input of the custom connector. And then here, the only difference is we're logging at that, at that error level. So I'll demo that. I'll pass in Pikachu. And what we're gonna see here is actually the exact same thing. So it's not gonna be anything new and exciting, but it's just a way to demonstrate how we've standardized that log with a custom connector and how to create that custom connector to do the exact same thing that you could um, with a standard connector. And if I send in an error request, let's go look on Cloud Hub. And we'll be able to see this on Elk also because it's using the same Log4j setup that the standard log is using. All right, so we have our error request here, formative error message. We know that it failed, calling out to that Pokemon API. If I plug this in, we have that traceability. We saw event one. 
Uh, event two was the error, so we know that it didn't call that Pokemon API the first time, probably because that Pokemon name was, was test. If we go to Kibana, what we can do here is search for that transaction ID. So I'm just gonna add simple filter in here on the transaction ID. And what we got was our, our story to tell. Uh, for that other transaction that was successful, let's see if we can find that really fast. This is the first demo I've seen in a long time that it just worked the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Don't jinx it. Yeah, right. <laughs> but this is the last one. Okay. <laughs> Wi Fi is going to go out now. Right, exactly. Uh, so let's just edit this. And we can tell our story again. Um, you know, this is just the low level logs if you want to see it in a similar format to Cloud Hub. Easy filtering, easy searching with Kibana. And in your dashboard, we're going to tick up a couple of, re of requests there. That is it. Woo! I'm going to send this PowerPoint out to everyone. If you're interested in any of these, uh, you know, concepts or technology stacks, come and talk to us. You know, Elk, AWS. We can't focus too much on that because we're here to talk about MuleSoft. Um, but references for all this stuff is in these two slides, which I'll send out in an email blast. Um, and I just want to take any questions at this point, if there's any more.